It is a special edition of the Matt Berry Show here on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. We thought maybe the national championship recap was going to be the biggest story. But as we sit here today with the great Paul Feinbaum, it marks the one-week anniversary, a week to the day that the college football world was thrown on its axis when Nick Saban abruptly retired at Alabama. Since then, Kalen DeBoer has been named the head coach. He's putting a staff together as we speak. There's players portaling in and portaling out. But, Paul, you've had a week to digest. First of all, thanks for joining us. You've had a week to digest the Nick Saban retirement. Where are you with it? it it's still a lot to process, Matt. Uh, and I, I think what, what's even more interesting is what I do in the afternoon, talking to callers. They're still having a hard time with it. Uh, but it's now on, and, and now it's really trying to preserve what he has built. And with each hour, he adds coaching uh, assistants, some very good, uh, but continues to lose key players. As we we're coming on the air here, Caleb Downs, yep. probably the most valuable player on his team, uh, is moving toward the portal, perhaps to Georgia. Uh, that seems to be the likely landing spot, and that's a big blow. I, I don't want to turn it, make it into one player, but – Sometimes these things uh, circle around uh, one individual, and, and right now that's the biggest story. Yeah, Isaiah Bond was another huge loss for the Alabama Christmas Tide. He ended up at Texas with Sark, who continues to build through the portal. You mentioned uh, Caleb Downs. This is going to be probably one of the larger NIL deals that's not a quarterback we'll see out there. And so it'll be interesting to see, but the aftershocks of the Saban retirement continue and more and more has come out. You know, Reese Davis had the interview with him and the sit down, and he had talked about he didn't know five minutes before that he was going to do this. Ultimately, Paul, I think we're now at an inflection point in college football now that we've had a couple of cycles of NIL and Portal in that it's a young man's game. Coaching is now a younger man's game. And this isn't to say Saban couldn't do it at, at what, 72 years old. He's proven that he can do it. But I think at the end of the day, what we're starting to see now is if you don't have the energy to do this continuously 24-7, 365, Paul, it, we might see other legends step away. We've seen it in college hoops, and now we're starting to see it in college football. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we've seen it more in basketball uh, because there really aren't too many people in, in Saban's league, uh, age-wise. Uh, there are a couple, uh, but not many. And I think you're right. Uh, in you're, you're plugged in about as close as anybody, Matt. So you've heard you heard the rumors all year. He's tired. I mean, he never you've never heard Nick Saban admit to anyone he was tired. And this year, he seemed to tell everyone who was listening he was. Uh, so I don't think that's a big surprise uh, that he walked away. And I think he also knew uh, he left this place in great shape. Uh, it, it, I mean, yeah, he was winning championships about every two point three years. Uh, and he hasn't won one in, in, in three complete seasons. Uh, but his last four years at Alabama, he finished first, second, fifth, and fifth. That's, that's hardly a guy who fell apart. Uh, but by his standards, it wasn't good enough. And I think he decided it was, it was time to go on. And, you know, everybody thinks they know where he's going next, as, as we probably do. Uh, that's not really the issue. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, when you exit, you're no longer the story. Kalen DeBoer is the story at Alabama. Yeah, and and now as we advance the story, and it, like I said, it's been a week ago today, we're taping this Wednesday at around 1045 a.m. Eastern, that we were sitting there going, oh my goodness, Nick Saban's gone. We, You know, we talk about it all the time, like, you know, Brian Kelly being in a good spot, Lane Kiffin being in a good spot, Kirby Smart being in a good spot, to kind of sit there, Sark now, of are they going to be in the league when Saban walks away? And the answer to that now is yes. And so you have to project forward of who's going to be that dominant program. Because, Paul, I say this cautiously. And I hope the listeners understand what it is I'm really trying to say. The Alabama job pre-Nick Saban was one of need, meaning pre-Nick Saban, post-Gene Stallings, wasn't great. They suffered quite a bit. Nick Saban turned that into the most dominant program in college football. But the job became great because of what Nick Saban made it. Now Kalen DeBoer comes in, follows an all-time great, but where is the Alabama job now with knowing how, what Nick Saban was able to make it be? 
Yeah, I mean, it's certainly. Uh, I mean, if we're if, if we're watching this uh, in in the parlance of Wall Street, and Jim Cramer sitting here instead of me, uh, he's he's worried uh, because I'm already hearing Alabama people say, "Yeah, there'll be a course correction." <laughs> you didn't hear that for the last 17 years. A course correction was losing the national championship game to Clemson uh, or Georgia. It's not uh, trying to figure out where you are. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, DeBoer was probably as good as you could. I mean, if you and I were naming five names, he would, you know, he would now be on it. He wouldn't have been on it before last Monday night. Right. Uh, but he's, uh, you know, Dan Lanning, uh, Sark, the usual suspects. But when, when you introduce a coach and, and, and under uh, on the Chiron, that's what you put under the person's name if you're watching a sports center with Matt Berry, National Coach of the Year. I mean, that's that's a pretty impressive thing to put on your resume as you're being introduced at Alabama. Yeah, and he did it for two years. I mean, his rise has been meteoric at Fresno State, kind of turned them around. He's an OC at Indiana, got a head coaching job, an opportunity at Fresno State. He was there for a couple of years, goes up to Washington. Here's where I and it takes Washington 11 and two and then undefeated into the national championship game. He did a lot through the portal. He didn't build stability at Washington in that he didn't go all in on high school recruiting, which a lot of coaches don't, but he did it through the portal. And now that he's gone and most of the offense is gone, we're going to see with Jed fish who left Arizona to take that job, what that program is going to be at Washington, because I don't think there was much left over. So now you take a coach that's got a small resume, albeit an impressive one, that goes to a program that Paul, through pretty much 95% of saving 17 years there, was done through the best recruiting in the country and the best talent development in the country. And I don't know that Alabama fans are going to sit back and want this to be a microwave thing where you bring in a couple of portal guys, heat them up, try to compete, and move on to the next season. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing you're already noticing is, uh, are, are there sharks in the water? Yeah. I mean, these aren't just great white. These are great white serial killer sharks. Uh, and they go by the name of Kirby Smart, Lane Kiffin, uh, Brian the Kelly. Uh, sorry. I mean, I, I would throw Hugh Freeze in there, but that's for another day. I mean, his program <laughs> is uh, is under enough enough problems from within, let alone from you know worrying about catching Nick Saban. Um, X program. So, yeah, I mean, that's really the problem. And and that's the one thing that you don't get a chance. Well, as you're flying across the country Friday, which is uh, about five and a half hours from Seattle to Tuscaloosa, your program is under assault and there's nothing you can do about it from 38,000 feet. And and that's really what how he landed. And the, and, and 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 I, I think he'll cat he'll figure it out. But before he figures it out, uh, uh, he's already lost his probably most valuable coach, Tavarius Robinson. Great recruiter, great coach. He's already gone to Georgia. Uh, he uh, he's lost five or six players in the portal, and, and the one and the one we mentioned earlier, Caleb Downs. People will say, "Well, he's a freshman." Yeah, he's a freshman that very well made the most the, may may have been the most valuable player on that team last year, other than maybe Jalen Milrow down the stretch. So well, and I'm glad you pointed that out because that's inflection point. Number two for me is that group of five head coaching jobs used to be, I mean, one Sun Belt, South Alabama, and one is Mac in Buffalo. These used to be, Paul, legitimate stepping stone opportunities for these head coaches to then maybe get into, you know, a job, let's call it in the Mountain West. Maybe that's a stepping stone or maybe a, a, a bottom tier power five job start building their career. Paul, they understand now group of five head coaching jobs, your rosters are getting pillaged by power five. I can't remember the last time two sitting head coaches left for assistant coaching jobs. To me, that, yeah. that's a sign of what, what's coming. Uh, you're right. And, and by the way, those are, uh, you know, we're talking about, high paying jobs at Alabama where you are on the center stage. And if you're successful, you'll, you'll land that big job that you probably would have landed anyway, but uh, you're making a lot more money and getting a lot better experience being the coordinator at Alabama than the head coach at Buffalo or, or South Alabama. So, yeah. And, and again, I, I mean, he, the, he, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking here on Wednesday. He landed on Friday afternoon. That is not a lot of time. 
but in in the world that we live in it's a it's, it's a lifetime yeah and that look end of the day alabama and i had said this i had tape something here Matt Barry show last week about when you look at it because I I find and I said this and there were a lot of people that didn't didn't like it but I I think that you would agree what was in it for Dan Lanning and Sark and these guys to take the job there was nothing in it for them because mostly Sark he can build in Alabama at Texas but Oregon sitting up there in the Pacific Northwest going to the big 10 with how Dan Lanning recruits, he could legitimately win that conference year in and year. What was in it for two of these stars of the sport to take the job? I don't think they settled on Kalen DeBoer, but I think at the end of the day, he was the most likely to take the job because the star coaches knew better than to step into a situation and replace Nick Saban. Yeah. And I think Lanning's the most interesting and, you know, he had to lean on what Mario Cristobal did and Willie Taggart, two coaches before him at Oregon and Taggart blew up, you know, Cristobal is struggling, may end up being successful, but by the way, speaking of Cristobal, if he'd gone back three or four years ago, if he'd stayed at Oregon, he would have been, he would have been the leading candidate. No question. uh, Nick Saban. Uh, But I, I, I mean, they're, they're, it's a cliche and I hate it because I've lived through transitions. And you you want to be the guy after the guy. That's not always successful either. Uh, I've seen the guy after the guy in Alabama and it was Bill Curry. Uh, and he went down in flames, uh, fleeing there after three years to go to Kentucky. So that's not automatic. Uh, there's no there's no there's no tr- tried uh, axiom right now to describe Alabama because we don't really know. Uh and, and and ultimately, what is success for Kalen DeBoer? Uh, if he if he gets to the playoffs ne- next year, that's good, but not good enough. Uh, he's going to be living in a long shadow, and yeah, you know, a lot of people have debated why was Nick Saban at the press conference on Saturday. And I'm told by people, and I'm, 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 I'm and later today I'll be talking to the AD at Alabama, Greg Byrne, and maybe get some more clarification that Saban is involved and he's involved because he has to be involved. There's so many yeah. players that he has agreed with to stay that they need Saban on board right now to complete the deals. Yeah. He's almost acting as a de facto president and G- CEO of the pro. He's going to have an office there in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> I don't know how well that's ultimately going to go with how Saban's wired relative to Kalen DeBoer kind of saying, Hey man, like I got to be in your shadow anyway. You got a statue with, with pies out in front of it. Like, you know, we, we, I respect you. I mean, Spurrier's got an office at the swamp. The stories yeah. Dan Mullen tells me about him are hilarious. But at the end of the day, the boar has to build this thing through his eyes after Saban helps secure some recruits and some portal. And you, you mentioned what is success for the boar. You know, in 17 years at Alabama, 17 years, Nick Saban didn't have double digit wins once mm-hmm. first time that is absolutely insane that in 2007 his first year on the job was the only year they didn't win double digit games so for me that says well you get year one maybe not to win double digit games but after that we expect 16 consecutive seasons of 10 wins or more yeah and matt uh, for any newcomers to this show um i spent 30 years in Alabama, I covered the transition between uh, Bear Bryant and, and Ray Perkins. And that was one of the most difficult things I've ever seen because uh, everything the guy, everything the new guy did, and by the way, he came from the New York Giants as the head coach. So right. he thought he knew everything. He didn't know anything, even though he played at Alabama. Um, and the board will, will get a pass, but this is not a world where anyone is patient anymore. Uh, and there will be meltdowns by the hour uh, and, and, but he'll have to, he'll have to endure that. And there's, I have no earthly idea whether he will or won't. I mean, anybody who thinks they know is just making it up. Yeah. And well, I mean, no one ever would do that on TV or in media, make stuff up to create a good conversation. It just doesn't happen. Uh, I do want to get into this before we get out of here, kind of a season in review, Michigan wins the national championship. They do so in dominant fashion over Kalen DeBoer's Washington Huskies. Now the next shoe for us to drop who who work in college football is Jim Harbaugh. I was proud of you and your Mia Coppola on Harbaugh when you were going on the various television programs of ESPN saying you've never been more dead wrong about anything in your life about the Jim Harbaugh experience. I hope the Michigan fans now will welcome you into their living rooms. But now, Paul, 
we sit and wait. We know Harbaugh interviewed with the Chargers. We know he interviewed with the Falcons. We know, based on some credible reporting from people who cover Michigan football, that negotiations with the Wolverines are at an impasse because of certain clauses in the contracts. So this is going to be a two-parter for me. Part one, where does this end with Harbaugh in your estimation? I suspect it ends pretty quickly uh, with whatever other job he wants to interview for. And I, I don't understand how the NFL does it. It's very bizarre. They, they're, because of the Rooney rule, they acknowledge who they interview. This isn't double secret. He needs to go. Uh, he needs to come or go. I can't imagine why he would stay. Uh, if, he's, if he's trying to argue uh, a clause in his contract that would make him immune from any NCAA violations, that's a non-starter. You can't do that. Right. So. I think he's uh, I think he's on his way out. And then it's whether uh, more gets moved up or they open that search. I, I think Michigan's in pretty good shape. Um, and why? I mean, I think would be, the biggest upset to me would be for Jim to stay, uh, because I think everybody has already discounted the fact that he's leaving. And that, I think it's an NFL story more than a Michigan story. And, and when, I, when I did that mea culpa, I, I think sometimes, Matt, you just have to move on. Uh, I. I Five years ago, I would have just kept going, as you know. Uh, I would have been on the couch with, uh, and you would have tried to be getting me to be poly positive. But I, th I think you, I came away respecting what Harbaugh did on the field. And I'm, I'm just so over everything that happens off the field uh, in today's world. I mean, we're talking about whether Nick Saban can, can help out to buy players. Uh, to give them enough money that he promised to keep them to stay. And I'm going to get upset about something that the NCAA is looking into that I, that I think most of us don't even understand what it's about. No, I'm, I'm moving on. Yeah, because he, he, look, I said this on College Football Final uh, directly after the national championship, that when you look at, at, at Jim Harbaugh, well, what did he set out to do in his 10 years at Michigan? He set out to return his alma mater back to where they believe is their rightful place in college football, which is among the nation's elite. Okay. He struggled doing that for a while. He couldn't get over the Ohio state hump. He's beat him three consecutive years. He couldn't get over the semifinal hump. He did that. Well, now he can, and he can leave Ann Arbor. Here you go, guys. I gave you 10 years, a national championship, three consecutive big 10 championships, three consecutive spots to play off. I have elevated Michigan football back to where it needs to be. It's time for me to go. Whereas two to three years ago, I think Michigan fans would have been pissed. Now I think they're like, you know what, Jim, we got what we needed. Thanks, brother. You're out. And, and you know, the most interesting part of this, I think you, you, they just named a new AD at Ohio State, Ross Bjork, who, uh, who fired Hugh Freeze at Ole Miss and Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M. And the, and the coach who I'm more concerned about than anybody right now is Ryan Day. You know, don't throw up his gaudy record. Uh, I, I'm well aware of what he has done, but but his popularity, uh, he looks like a, 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 a busted stock on Wall Street. Uh, and, you know, should he lose to the new coach at Michigan, whoever that is, this guy's got problems. And what does that mean for Mike Elko, who was just hired by Bjork? I mean, look, he hasn't even had year one, and I think he was a popular hire amongst the AM fans. But now a and going to have to bring in an AD. And what if said AD comes from, I don't know, pick a school that's got a hot, trendy coach? Like now, now we're just – now we're restarting the cycle because you're right. What's the one thing we in the media always say when a coach struggles? Well, the new AD didn't hire him. Yeah. Uh, that goes for every business, and we are well aware of that, <laughs> even in ours. Um, and it, it, and I, I would bring it up because as the season begins, I mean, people will speculate about Billy Napier and and Sam Pittman and this coach and that coach. But but I'm fascinated by the Ryan Day story because there's never been a coach in college football history who has had a better record uh, and is uh, is talked about behind his back more today than Ryan Day. Yeah, keep an eye on this one, especially, by the way, with C.J. Stroud, who's going to win Rookie of the Year. Yeah. He's got the Texans in the divisional round of the playoffs, and on that same roster with C.J. Stroud, Garrett Wilson, yeah. Chris Olave, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, and a young Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, again, uh, Ohio State's one of the biggest brands in football. Ryan Day is one of the most successful coaches. But Ryan, uh, 
as we say down here, don't 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 buy any green bananas. I mean, your time is coming. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, and I, and I encourage you not to go down this rabbit hole. But if you really want to get into some coaching craziness, go find it on the internet. And the darkest part to the internet of this, the theories now of the Jed Fish move to Washington. You know, he only stays everywhere about two years, right? And now people are already placing him at Florida because yeah. he's a Florida grad when Billy Napier gets canned. But it's like this dude hasn't even coached a game at Washington and you're already putting him at Florida. Yeah, I remember the, the first time I talked to him, and I know you know him better than I do, uh, but all we talked about was Spurrier. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's another name out and I'm not, I'm going to leave it for the next, but there's another okay. name out there who I think, uh, will be prominent. And if, if uh, a very, if, big yeah, yeah, if. I mean, <laughs> if, if Florida ends up looking for a coach, but I, I don't want to go there because Billy Napier is a good man and he's, he's, uh, he's done a good job of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, can I get back to you on that? Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll table the discussion. We are just entering the long off season. We've got plenty of time to break down each team and their bona fides. Uh, Paul Feinbaum, great stuff. We gave it a week. You were the most sought after man in media after the Nick Saban uh, news a week ago today. We're glad that you made some time for us. It was a great conversation, but I don't know how we're going to move forward. Oh, here, I'll give you, I'll end it on this one. Who now in your mind, in college football is the top of the sport other than can't say Kirby smart because we know he's, but who now other than Kirby is the guy. That's a, that's a, obviously a difficult question. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, if I'm looking for a guy to buy stock in uh, that I think is going to keep getting better, it would probably be Steve Sarkeesian. I was going to go Sark or Brian Kelly. I think LSU yeah. just got over their biggest hurdle. And with how he's recruiting, how he's oh. recruiting, I, I, what have we always said? LSU could have been Alabama if Nick Saban stayed. Any coach who figures that thing out, you could have Alabama for a decade. I think that's where we are with Brian Kelly and LSU. Yeah, I agree with you. And it, it, it's not only from a recruiting standpoint. He, he hired uh, Corey Raymond yesterday from yep. Florida. Why he, how they let him go at Florida, I'll never know. But he... He is uh, that that announcement alone has energized people in Louisiana because he, he has brought in some of the best players in LSU history. Yeah. Buy your stock in Baton Rouge. We've, we've got a lot of stock talk today. Maybe I will have my pal Kramer come on, who, by the way, loves visiting the Sports Center studios. Very, very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Big, big. <laughs> you introduced you introduced him to me one time up there. That's and, right. <laughs> uh, I, 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 he's still bugging me. <laughs> look he'll do that from time to time paul great stuff look forward to doing this again with you soon between now and then i think i'll bug you when the harbaugh stuff goes down and we'll, we'll dive into that hey my schedule i have nothing to do until july so call me anytime music to our ears thank you paul thank you.